Hey, Game Changers, Barry William Magliadidi here and uh, just finished an incredible interview with the bet who calls herself the decision-making maverick. So she has a very unique ability to uh, take business strategy paired with competitive advantage uh, into energetic leadership styles and create absolutely raging businesses. Uh, I think you're going to love this episode because uh, we dive into two things that are close to my heart. Number one being strategy in business. A lot of business owners and entrepreneurs misunderstand what strategy is. They think that strategy is having a basic business plan to go from woe to go. Uh, whereas in actual case, there's it's a lot more than that and can really see your business regardless of where you are right now, whether you're you know, doing six figures a year or multiple seven figures, uh, absolutely annihilate the competition. And uh, I love the way that she pairs that with understanding, uh, similar to my beliefs, around how important mindset is in business, and even more than mindset, like understanding that principle that I often talk about that, you know, we never have business problems, we only ever have personal problems expressed through our business. And, and I will uh, go to bat to anyone that disbelieves that because every single problem in a business comes from a decision somebody's made, and our decisions are made based on uh, either current information or past experiences, and often. A lot of decisions are made uh, through people with an unconscious awareness. So if you're keen to find out more around uh, this art of strategy, competitive advantage, uh, why companies like Kodak and uh, Blockbuster and so forth cease to be alive right now, why taxi licensing prices have gone from half a million dollars a year in Sydney down to 75,000 and why Uber was able to seemingly overnight um, come in and smash the marketplace. I'm sure you get a lot out of this interview with the vet. I'm not going to waste any more time. Let's uh, head out of the interview now and I look forward to hearing all your feedback. And if I can ask a favor as well, uh, I would absolutely love if you guys could jump onto iTunes, give the Comeback Game a five-star review so we can get a message and our uh, obviously interviews out to a wider, wider and broader audience as well. Let's over there, head over there now. So today we have Babette Ben Susan from MindShift.com. How did I go with the last name? Very well. You went very well. Fantastic. So uh, looking forward to our conversation today, as always, it could go absolutely anywhere. I see you, uh, you run an organization called mindshifts.com.au, a vast amount of experience. But um, what I'd love is just to give yourself a little bit of an introduction. I know sometimes it's hard to introduce ourselves, but um, mm -hmm. love a bit of an introduction for those that are watching or listening today, um, a little bit about you, Babette, and what it is that you do. Okay. So for the past uh, 25 years, I have run my own consulting business in the area of strategy and competition. Um, in those 25 years, I've written uh, seven books on the topic oh. of uh, business analysis and strategy and competitive intelligence. Um, I've taught in MBA programs, the books have been translated and everything, but I got an award in the US, which was like getting the Oscar. And I thought, well, where do I go from here? So then um, I did a postgrad degree in counseling uh, to be, work as a counselor. And I thought, why am I doing that and throwing all my business experience out the window? Because prior to running my own consulting firm, I also worked for Apple Computers, Levi Strauss, all in marketing. Yeah. So someone said, why don't you become a coach? So I thought, oh, that's a great idea. I can combine my, you know, consulting, my work and teaching expertise and coaching. So I went looking for a, a program. There were two things I wanted from the program, which was very strategic in my decision making. And that was one, it had to give me automatic accreditation with the International Coaching Federation. And two, it had to give me a unique tool that would differentiate me from other coaches. And I found this course in the US and I um, went over to the US four times, did the degree, <laughs> did, well, did the course. And I became a coach and started working as a coach, a uh, credited coach in 20, um, 2012. And yeah, so that's eight years ago, my God. And I'm now a PCC, which is a professional certified coach. And I'm studying medical coaching, which is coaching for patients. So wow. there's my little story. <laughs> so you, you've gone in and out and around, up and down, um, started with strategy. I noticed you tied that in with your unique point of difference as well. It's interesting because um, a lot of people don't understand that strategy very much ties in with marketing and positioning in the marketplace as well. And this was something that I learned a few years ago studying um, Bern Harnish's work, Scaling Up, 
um, also through um, Three Hag Way and um, the metronome effect with uh, Susan Shizek, which is uh, Burns, was Burns kind of, I guess, one of his uh, high level pupils. And what I really found interesting is I was like, where's, where do they talk about marketing in the four decisions around people, strategy, execution, and uh, cash? And nested under strategy, as you're probably aware, is marketing. So the other thing you mentioned, though, is around competition and strategy. Can you share a bit more around like the, the relationship between competition and strategy? Because I don't think you necessarily mean competition as in another competitor in the marketplace, per se, more so as probably aligned with your strategy. So I'd love to dive a little bit on that one first. So a lot of organisations, a lot of business people, whether you're small, medium or large, tend to make decisions about their business growth um, in light of what they know, of, of what yeah. exists. And they tend to do it also in light of existing competitors, uh, mm. of competitors that they are aware of. And so what happens is that most companies will say, well, our revenues last year were a million dollars. This year we're going to make it 2.5. Yeah, you and who else is what I yeah. ask. Yeah. So th the issue is your competitors, uh, what influences your competitive ability mm. is not just competitors because you have government influence, you have technology influence, you have uh, substitute products and services. Instead of buying yours, I might, instead of buying a washing machine, I might buy a fridge. You know, there are a whole lot of things that shape your competitive environment, which, and it's not just your competitors. So I always talk about um, taxi to taxi drivers. I always talk to taxi drivers and I say to them, has Uber affected you? It's like, duh. <laughs> and, you know, Ola and all of those. And I said, and, you know, and the tragedy of it, it, it just upsets me so much because Uber and Ola didn't happen overnight. There were signals. So if you were looking at other taxis like yellow cabs or uh, silver service or anything, they're your existing competitors. But where were the, the cooperatives looking at new entrants? Mm -hmm. potential companies that could disrupt your whole industry. Mm -hmm. This is where people look at strategy in isolation of the competitive environment. And mm -hmm. what I'm saying is you need to be, you need to understand the competitive environment first in order to develop a sound strategy. Because yeah. once you develop a strategy, Barry, you're going to put marketing to it. You're going to put effort in it. You're going to put plans to it. You're going to put dollars to it. So, mm. you know, if you're just going to look at the existing competitors and the greatest tragedy is a taxi driver said that in Sydney, a taxi license was worth $500,000. Nowadays with Uber and Ola, that same license is worth $75,000. You know, $500,000, $75,000. So here's someone who's mortgaged their home, who's, who's borrowed to the hilt, and it's now only worth $75,000. And my answer is, I feel sorry for them. But the point mm. is, under which rock were people living to not know Uber was coming down the pipeline or Ola? And, and Uber doesn't cost you anywhere near $75,000 to the point I've ever heard of Uber got drivers where Uber has given them the car and they've paid it off through their Uber fees. You know, like, like ease, ease to market. This is such a great conversation. But, but you know, this is what gets me is, you know, nothing, nothing happens to your business happens in a, in a vacuum. There is always signals, whether it's international, whether it's from the government, you know, I always think of um, Slater and Gordon. So they, they bought a company in the UK and um, they had a strategy, a Pac-Man strategy. You know what a Pac-Man strategy is? 
gobble, 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 gobble. Yeah. Acquisitions, acquire, yeah. acquire, acquire, acquire. Called the Pac-Man strategy. Anyway, they bought this company in the UK and um, analysts wanted to know whether they were concerned about the new health legislation that the UK government was going to bring in. They bought an insurance company and they were concerned. The analysts asked, you know, are you concerned about the um, change in legislation? And the CEO at the time said, you know, no, it won't affect us. It's, it's not going to be, be an issue. It's not going to happen. He said that 10 days later, the UK government brought in the new legislation, which wiped that whole business out. So I want you to tell me which government on this planet can go from zero to full blown past legislation in 10 days. Mm. It doesn't exist. Mm. There's arguments, pros, the particles get in, the different parties. You know, mm. there is so many stories. There's a battlefield of mm. stories like this where people don't understand the competitive environment. So they acquire companies. And it frustrates me a little because leaders are responsible for their employees. Yeah. You know, the employees rely on those jobs for income to pay for school fees to send their school kids you know uniforms and the problem is that we have boards of directors and we have senior executives who are making strategic decisions without understanding clearly the competitive environment and if you yeah. think you know it tell me what happened to kodak what happened yeah. to nokia Blockbuster. Yeah, Blockbuster. There's, there's, Thank you. There's so, there's, this is going to say there's so many examples like that. I, I, don't, I don't know who said, I think it might have been Peter Drucker, but they talked about strategy, um, you know, culture eating strategy for breakfast, right? And it's an interesting conversation. Culture will eat strategy for breakfast every day of the week. And my interpretation on that is because a solid culture has entrepreneurs with inside an organization that allows a collective consciousness to, to be able to see around corners rather than following a, 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 a made up map with no, no shifts. And you don't have to look too far, like here in Australia or in Australia, you've got Woolworths and Coles that are constantly at it. And like I watched Woolworths launch their Ushis strategy, right? They annihilated Coles with that strategy because it, it drew people in, it, it lifted the average uh, price of the cart value and gave people a reason to switch over from Coles to Woolworths. So McDonald's are another one. I ask you, if they were so good, how come Aldi took so much of their market share away? This is true. And IGA? Here, IGA, I love it. Stayed, old system, and look how they're going now. Mm. They are going gangbusters. And I would shop, I love IGA. <laughs> That's another story. But I'm just saying, you know, IGA, yeah. uh, you know, the owners work in it. It's local produce. Aldi, look at Aldi. So yeah. here's Coles and Woolworths. Yeah. Battling each other out, short-sighted, blind-sided by their own uh, egotistical uh, warfare, whilst these, these creepers come in, like you say, Aldi, and takes a huge part of the market. There's, and now Costco, they're doing stuff. You've got IGA, they're doing stuff. Yeah. And now, and you've got to remember, Amazon are bringing out, is it Amazon Go? One. Or is well, it Amazon Prime, which is 24 hour delivery. No, there's one that's got a supermarket where there's no one there. Oh, wow. I thought it was Go, it was called Go. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. So this, so, is, this, is, this is strategy. You think? <laughs> And, and this is, you know, and, and I have to say, I'm very naughty, but I lay the blame at boards of directors and senior executives and owners of business. I don't have time. Fine, then you've got the time to run out of business. So how do you, how do you, that's a great question because I can hear so many people of our audience right now that are watching this, listening to this going like, easy for you to say like, I can barely even afford to pay my bills this week. 
I can't afford, don't know how I'm going to pay my staff next week. And you're telling me that I should sit down and create this master plan to overcome the wolves and the cold, the colds, the, the Woolworths and the colds in my organization. Let's, let's bring it a bit real mm-hmm. right now. Like if, if you're a business owner, you're doing multiple six figures, maybe multiple seven figures, not making a lot of money right now. How can I, how can they apply what you're saying in such a way that like, like I know, but I'd love to know your input. How can they apply that in such a, such a way that creates a competitive advantage without robbing them in the process? There are two things I would do. Number one, there is, um, I'd get uh, some facilitation around a strategic plan. Most people don't understand how to analyze their environment. So Mm -hmm. what I'd get them to do is get someone, if they don't know, hire someone who knows uh, industry fusion analysis, for example, and use that tool analytical tool to understand your competitive environment today and in five years out of that will come your strategic options and opportunities and threats there's a start secondly if you're running a smaller business get a coach because you're getting in the way of your own business sorry so i'm saying two things One, if you've got a team, I would get someone to come in to facilitate a strategic day, but make sure whoever you get has got some, um, a track record of success. There are far too many consultants out there who claim to do things and don't have a framework of how to run a strategy session. And that concerns me a great deal. And then the other thing is, if you're an owner of a business, get a coach because you're getting in your own way. If you're struggling to pay the bills, if you're working 24 hours a day, you're not, and I've coached executives like this and people, you know, whose wife says, I'm never home or I've got problems with the kids and I can't spend, I've got to spend time with the kids, but I've got my business. Yeah, well. It it, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be, that way like you're one decision away of changing your business and life right now yet in order for that to happen you have to you have to actually let go of what you know right it's like oh i can't i can't hire a coach because i haven't got the time to implement i haven't got the money it's like well you haven't got the time to implement i haven't got the money because you haven't got a coach right well and the other thing is why are you so frightened Mm. see what i'm hearing when someone says that i hear a lot of fear a fear of failure there's yeah. nothing wrong with failing. No. It's a wonderful opportunity. You know, I've, I, Mindshifts Group um, was a consultancy I set up on my own, you know, 25, 30 years ago. And I, like everybody else, wanted to expand. So I set up Mindshifts Marketing, Mindshifts Intelligence Solutions, Mindshifts, a whole heap institute. They all failed. They all failed. So I know what failing is all about. But what I learned, that it was okay to fail. Yeah. I tried yeah. it. It wasn't the time. It wasn't the place. And I had yeah. to let, let it go. And that's why I'm saying I do understand. But if you're saying, I don't have the time, I don't have this, then you're getting in your way of success. You're, you're frightened. Well, it's proven that people will do far more to hold on to what they've got than to... You know, they'll do far more to protect a million dollars than they want to make a million dollars because as shitty as the environment is that they have right now or as much as things aren't working, they at least know what they're getting and it's safe. There's the fear there of the unknown, the fear there of what if I let go and things actually work or what if I let go and things are worse off than what I am? Well, what if you continue doing what you've, what you've done and you're still here in 10 years' time? That's what you guy asked. Like, I've met a lot of people. It's taken them 10 years to get to a million dollars in revenue and in 12 months, we've, we've doubled, tripled that. Right. The reality is, is it doesn't have to be as hard as what it is right now. So let me give you a very good explanation. And you said something that was really insightful. You said that people stick to what they're comfortable with. So it is a known fact that 90% or plus, I'll just use 90% as a figure. I think it's more than that, but 90% of lottery winners Within five years. Is it? 98%. 98%. Yep. Of, you know where I'm going, don't you? Yep. Yep. Keep 90, going. 
98% of lottery winners end up back on the poverty line where they were after five years. Worse off financially than when they won the lotto. You got but it. But you know what? There's people out there right now going, if I won the lotto, it'd be different. It wouldn't <laughs> happen to me. I, I would invest it differently. <laughs> but don't you think, don't you think that those 98% of people said the same thing? The reality is, 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 is that often it's not a conscious thought processing that's making these decisions for us. They're making these decisions based on a lot of pre, pre past programming yes. from the reptilian brain. And that's exactly it. We get in our own way of our success. I'm a firm believer that you create the reality you want. Yeah. The problem is that most people want that reality yesterday. Well, you didn't work on it yesterday, but with a coach, you can work on it now to create it in 12 months, in, in uh, two years, whatever it is. If you can dream it, you can create it but it means you have to work hard at it. You have yeah. to work at it and you have to get out of your blind spots, your assumptions, your limiting beliefs, your biases. Otherwise, you know, you stay where you are. And as you said, you're comfortable. Most people are very comfortable with what's wrong. Yeah. Well, they know. I yeah. think you're dead right on that, Barry. Totally. Yeah. So what's been your biggest failure? Like you've, you've got to have seen a lot in 25 years being in business. Like I know, I know what I see in a year, let alone 25 years. Like what, where do you feel has been your biggest failure or, or even your biggest learning in the past 25 years? Because I honestly believe we learn more out of failure than we do out of success. I do too. I do too. I think not believing in myself so mm. I have the woman issue of why would people listen to me? Who am I? Um, the, uh, there was part of the imposter syndrome that was getting in my way. Um, yeah. So I think for me, my biggest lesson was not calling a spade a spade mm. to CEOs, to senior executives, because I mean, you know, they're up there and I'm here. I think that was, but that's a blind spot of mine. Yeah. That got in my way. Um, my failures are all my blind spots. The, and, the biases and, I had. And, and all I'm hearing again is that your biggest failures are, are what we call the inner game. Yes. Right? The inner game. Like your connection to your heart, your authenticity, your beliefs, your values, what you stand for. You know, it's all in the game. Curious to know, right? Do you think it's possible that if you've got the most kick-ass strategy in the world, you've done your analysis, but you've got a shit mindset that, that you will still mess it up? Bingo. I'm with you, Barry. Yeah. Like, I honestly believe that 80% of the work we should be doing as business owners, as let's not just say business owners, as partners, as lovers, as fathers, as mothers, as friends, as human beings is working on the real estate, the six inches of real estate between the two, two ears and our heart, you know, connecting deeper to ourself and, and authentically who we really are and clearing up all the nonsense and, and, and the, the noise that's here because we are not our thoughts. Like our thoughts say some crazy so, stuff. Sometimes. Ah, but hold on a second. So I come from a school that believes you have a thought first as a result of a thought you will feel something as a result of feelings. You will then behave in a certain way. So if you have a thought, let's say, of uh, conflict, mm. you know, there's a conflict between being home, working on the invoices, there's that conflict. The yeah. feeling you'll have is anger. And so what you'll behave is, I don't have the time. I'm working hard. I'm doing the best I can. Yeah. But it started with the thought that you mm. believe there's a conflict. Mm. If you change that thought and think, this is what I'm doing right now. When I'm with my family, I will be present to my family. When I'm doing something else, if it gets done, it gets done. If it doesn't, it's okay. I won't die. Do you think, do you think, both are true. Like, like here we are having the conversation, right? Like at, at the grassroots, we're having the conversation. What came first? 
the chicken or the egg, right? When yep. you think about that conversation, how could a chicken exist without being hatched from an egg? Yet how can an egg exist without being hatched from a chicken? What you just shared, right? You're sharing about how the thought creates a feeling. I also believe, I, I agree with that. And I also believe that it is absolutely possible that we can have a feeling, an intuition, an instinct long before there's a thought that goes with that. Like, like a divine, a divine inspiration or insight that comes. Well, that's through. a divine inspiration. That, that's a completely different thing. But Barry, for me, I think we don't recognize the thoughts that are going on in our heads. So yeah. one of the things I do as a coach is I work with a lot of clients with their gremlin. Now the gremlin is the little thing that sits on your shoulder that criticize ah, that's it. <laughs> says you're not good enough. You can't do this. You're not a good person. You're an imposter. The thing is that we need to understand and, and I have clients who say, I don't have a gremlin. So I say to them for the next two weeks, I want you to hear and listen to that inner voice to whatever that inner voice is. And sure enough, everybody comes back and acknowledges they've got a gremlin. Found so my gremlin. Sorry? Found my gremlin. It was disguised as yeah. Pikachu. You got it. And the moment you can hear the gremlin, and part of the work I do is to change the relationship you have with your gremlin. Yeah. So, um, and it changes the way people hit themselves over the head, you know? Yeah. It's just, but I, I'm from the school that I think there is always a thought first. It would be yeah. instantaneous. It is the thought is, to me is the spark. Mm. And whatever that spark is, whatever it is intuitively, you will then feel something. Mm. And as a result of that, you'll then behave in a certain way based on that feeling. But if we mm. can change your thinking, we can change your feeling, which changes your behaviors. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. One of my earlier, very earlier mentors shared with me, he said that, you know, as as human beings, we never make a bad decision, right? Because often a lot, a lot of time people will look back and be like, oh, that was a bad decision I made. Yet at the time, no one ever makes a decision thinking that it's a bad decision, right? They make Correct. a decision. Well, right. tell that to Kodak, tell that to Nokia, <laughs> to the board, tell that to a whole lot of ex senior executives around the world. <laughs> yeah, well, at that and point politicians. in time, they, they make a decision, right? And that decision is, is the best decision at the point in time. Yet often we're picking from an impoverished menu. menu. The menu we're picking from is impoverished. So we make the best decision, but it's just a shitty looking menu. And Ooh, life gives us... That's a good expression. I like that. Life gives us new meals to add to our menu that allows us to make better educated decisions. I, I like that, that you, you, you're making a decision from a limited menu. Love it. That's a, you know, a lot very of time, good analogy. Yeah, a lot of the time, coaches, I, I see a lot of like life coaches, I yes. see life coaches, but coaches in general try to like help people rip out their limiting beliefs or remove their limiting beliefs. Whereas for me, yes. I think these beliefs, at, at a point in time that we made them, they served us. Now, they might not serve us now we're 20 years older or 30 years older, but they served us at a point in time. And so rather than like disrespecting that aspect of us that, that, that is in service, yeah. just a little bit outdated, it's like if we add something new to the menu, we can start yes. to make a decision. And yes. that part of us still gets to remain there, but no longer in the driver's seat. Correct. Correct. Yeah. What's Correct. the, um, what's the best, God, there were so many ways I could have taken this conversation with you. And there was just so <laughs> much here in the beginning. And uh, I'm glad we went. Strategy is something that really fascinates me. And, and probably even more of what fascinates me is just the human conditioning and, and what we do to feel loved and to feel belonged and to feel connected and to have ourselves heard and validated. But, you know, what would you say to, somebody who's watching or listening to this right now, what would you say to the 10 year old version of yourself? If you had a chance to speak to her and share some, some wisdom or some insights to her, what would you say? What advice would you give her? None. 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 Because if oh, I God. did, that child wouldn't come to be me who I am today. Wow. So I wouldn't. Wow, I've never had, I've, heard, I've asked this question a few times, I've never had the response. Yeah, no, yeah. I wouldn't. Because if, that, if I gave that child some advice, 
then I wouldn't be who I am today. Mm. Do you reckon, I'm going to ask another question. Sorry, we, we might dive down a rabbit hole here for a little bit longer. <laughs> oh, I've, got this, I've got this theory that I've been working with. And I believe that what often keeps us stuck is us trying to move away from the experience we're having instead of accepting it. Now, what I mean, hear me out. Oh, I get what you. I mean is it's not accepting, oh, my finances are in a shitty position. I need to accept that I'm just broke or my relationship sucks. That's what we're talking about. What we're talking about is that if you can't accept and appreciate and be grateful for where you're at right now, how the hell, when your life is exactly the way you want it to be, do you think you could be more appreciative or grateful just because you've got something? You, the gratitude and the appreciation starts right now with whatever shitty wrapper you got life has, like life has thrown up to you. Whatever that thing is, it's I a agree. gift from a shitty wrapper. And if you'd accept it and be grateful for it, you can then actually start to live your life more fulfilled, more free. And, and, you know, that's why when I look, everything in my past has made me who I am today. Yeah. Every experience, good, bad, whatever. Yeah, there are some experiences that still hurt me when I reflect on them. That, yeah. you know, but you know, I, I, I'm sorry if, if I love who I am now and I enjoy, I'm grateful for everything I have in my life now, whether it's good or bad. Yeah. And, I, you know, number one, I'm blessed to be living in Australia. Yeah. You know, uh, we really, we really are so lucky. Enough said. Enough said. I love that. I love that. Look, for anyone who um, has got a lot from today's conversation, there was so much to take from that that would like to connect with you. What's the easiest way they can find you and uh, continue the conversation? They can email me direct to babette uh, at mindshifts.com.au. That's yeah, the easiest way. Mindshifts.com.au. Yeah. Awesome. With an S. Mindshifts with an S. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So look, if you, uh, if you've enjoyed the conversation as much as I have, and you want to continue that, uh, and check in at some of the amazing work that the vet's doing, uh, please feel free to reach out to her equally please. too. If you're uh, curious or interested around any of the game changing programs that we have for business owners, uh, my team's always ready and available to have a chat to see, uh, if you're a fit for the game changers programs as well. But bet, um, we're going to have another interview soon because there is still a lot of things that I want to, uh, <laughs> want to inquire about within you and your, your past 25 plus years experience in business. So thank you so much for your time. I'd love that, Barry. Thank you. If you're in a position that many of our clients were before joining us, which is that your business is controlling you rather than you controlling your business, we would love to have a chat to you to see whether or not we might be the right fit to partner with you to help you grow and succeed in business. And over the past eight years, we've helped hundreds of business owners around the world to grow, scale and succeed in business. Uh, many of our clients report we've helped them to triple their profits and double their time off in 12 months or less. If you jump onto YouTube and notice the hundreds of testimonies, you'd see that this is a common theme amongst them. If you're a business owner that's generating more than $300,000 a year in annual revenue, uh, whether it's 500 million, 5 million, even $10 million a year, and you're looking to take your business and your life to the next level, we might be able to help. If you're noticing that your business is lacking structure, maybe systems or processes, maybe you're not quite attracting enough or, or the right type of quality leads, making enough sales, or maybe you've been having issues finding, hiring, retaining, and training the right team members, we could be a fit for you. Ultimately, we believe that we never have business problems, we have personal problems that are expressed through our business. And a lot of the work we do is with you as a business owner, helping you to constantly upgrade the way that you see life, the way that you make decisions, and the way that you help construct a profitable and purpose-driven business. In order for us to do that though, you need to book in a quick 15-minute uh, application call with one of our scaling specialists here at The Game Changers. Through the 15-minute call, we're gonna ask you a bunch of questions to see if or how we might better help you. If we can't help you, We'll let you know politely and do our best to point in the direction of someone that can. However, we can help you. We'll look at booking you a one hour game plan session where we're gonna dive a lot deeper into where you and your business are at right now, where it is that you want to go in the next three, five, and 10 years time, and what are the potential roadblocks or challenges or even opportunities that are along the journey in order for you to get there uh, faster. If you're really feeling that it's time for you to, to experience 
the love and the joy of running a business again. If you're really wanting to experience a business that does actually operate without you while still producing profit, uh, we may very well be the right fit. So book in a 15 minute call, we can have a chat and uh, see where we go from there. My name is Barry Baduti and uh, thanks for listening. Hopefully we'll get a chance to talk soon.